And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much and I'm happy to take any, any questions that you may have. Yo, thank you so much. That was, that was so beautiful. Um, and I remember reading that bit of the book about smiling and sort of having to put the book down and, and walk away because every single period drama has got it wrong, hasn't it? We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be smiling. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and it's um, Mary Beard actually talks a lot about that and, um, uh, you know, the, the, what the ancients did, in, you know, as to, to, to try and mimic our smile, you know, the, the, the curling up of the lips, which, again, we just, we just assume that they would have done exactly the same. They would have smiled in the same way that we do. And so, um, yeah, it's really fascinating when you actually think that so much of, of how we perceive the world and the emotions that we, that we, that we learn from those perceptions, uh, you know, are, are, as I say, constructed socially over time. Um, yeah. Complete. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to, um, audience, please, please type in your questions. They're coming in now, which is fantastic. But before we go to those, um, a couple of my own, because uh, I get to talk to you. Um, so firstly, you, you, you briefly mentioned cooking as, as, a, as a sort of insight into how the brain developed. Um, and and you, you write brilliantly, you say, uh, essentially humans swapped guts for brains. Um, could you just talk, talk a little, little bit more about why cooking um, was so key for that evolutionary process? Mm. Yeah, so essentially it's all about um, energy con conservation. So, you know, when, you, when food is cooked, especially meat, uh, the amino acids are broken down in a way that um, basically means that, uh, you know, that, that, that our own bodies don't have to do it. And so essentially the idea is that humans created an external stomach with fire and cooking. And so that by doing that, as I say, they, they swapped brains for guts. So they essentially had more energy, which they could then use um, you know, for, for their brains, for thinking about things, for problem solving, for you know, uh, group hunting and, and, and all of the cognitive challenges that would have come with you know, living in incredibly dangerous um, situations in our past. Um, and so, and there's some really interesting like physiological research as well that, uh, that looks at you know, exactly, um, exactly how cooking breaks down certain, certain amino acids. And um, I think they've done a lot of research on pythons as well, um, showing that, uh, I have to remember it now, but, um, so something showing that you know if, if if the meat is cooked when it's given to the python um it's more beneficial in some way for its for its brain and um i, I mean I, that's in the book but um it's something like that but they you know it, it, again it comes down to energy conservation mm -hmm. um with the way of us to have more energy for our brains so to stay on that like there's, there's been a lot recently on the kind of gut brain connection and you know, fecal transplants and probiotics that cure depression and things like that. Does that interest you at all at the moment? Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, the uh, the brain gut connection is really interesting. Um, I mean, it's the whole idea of the microbiome is it's it's still an area that is being actively explored. I think we've only scratched the surface. Um, the thing, I mean, I, the thing I find really interesting about it is that you know, when you when you um, when you create mice in a lab that have no microbiome. Um, so many parts of their of their of their body and and then their minds just don't develop. You know they don't develop um, you know blood brain barriers in the same way. They don't develop a healthy immune system. Um, and so you know we 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 really are a, a chimera, a fusion of of so many other organisms. I mean, I mean we know for instance that you know a lot of our own a lot of our DNA comes from viruses and bacteria, and we know that you know every cell in our body contains a mitochondria. Uh, you know, the, and then it's like a power, power plant, basically. But that was once a free-floating bacteria that essentially fused with with uh, you know eukaryotic cells. And I think the fascinating thing about the microbiome is that it's kind of it's a similar kind of um, symbiotic relationship, um, and it just shows that we're the product of of so much more than just just being human, essentially. Completely. Um, one, one, one more question for me, and then I'll get to the audience questions because there are some brilliant ones. But um, you, you mentioned uh, the Sukuma tribe of Tanzania having a, a phrase, one knee does not bring up a child, sort of the version of it takes a village. Um, and, and you say, you know, the fact is our social brains have evolved, not just for our nearest and dearest, but for the wider extended family of humankind. I think it's, it's easy, it's vogue to sort of see um, 
what you call allo parents or i mean allo parenting is is sort of non-nuclear family as kind of kooky super liberal stuff but you you make the case that it's actually in, in, inherent to how our brains developed you know that the nuclear family is pretty new and had we had nuclear families all the way back in the beginning our brains probably would have been very different could you could you just speak about that a little bit about allo parenting about that wider community yeah and no, absolutely i mean yeah it's it's really interesting because a lot of I mean, there is in neuroscience um, this idea called the social brain hypothesis, and and that idea essentially um, posits that we've we've um, evolved uh, huge brains to be social. When you look across the animal kingdom, uh, it's the animals with the biggest brains that are the the most sociable, and you know like uh, whales and dolphins, you know, incredibly sociable animals. But then you look at things like foxes and koalas and other animals with small brains, and they they live very um, solitary, isolated lives. And so, um, you know, and there's and Robin Dunbar as well, this uh, very famous anthropologist at Oxford, came up with Dunbar's number of 150 people, which um, he, he actually came to that, uh, 150 people being how many people um, each individual human can very successfully interact with. And he came to that number by actually looking at that, that the brain. Um, and so, I mean, essentially, there's so much evidence for, for this that we are, very social, uh, very uh, social animals. Um, that I find it, uh, it's more and more fascinating as time goes on with things like social media and how we're accept expanding our social circles, but also by the way that our societies, especially in the West, are kind of becoming a lot more individualistic. And you know, I think I, I make the, the case in the book as well that you know many Western societies are um, sort of atomizing themselves and becoming way too individualistic. Um, because of things like smartphones and social media and that's not actually what we evolved to do we evolved to be in these very large communities we evolved to, to help each other um, so you know if there's ever going to be a case and again it's not wishy-washy liberalism if there's ever going to be a case for um, you know compassion and helping fellow human beings it's just look through our natural history this is what we've evolved to do um, we're, we're, we're doing the exact opposite of what nature intended by being overly individualistic Completely brilliantly put. Okay, so Sabine has said, I love this talk, and I'm especially touched by what I have just learned about autism. Um, bringing emotion, sensory processing and neurosensitivity together, I wonder if we know anything about the evolutionary history of these skills, i.e. a wider and deeper bandwidth of impulse processing. Could you could you speak about your sort of your work on, on autism in the brain a little bit more? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's the, the autism stuff isn't actually uh, my own area. Um, I spoke to this wonderful uh, neuroscientist uh, called Penny Spitkins, um, who's at York University, but I think she's moved now. And she's uh, she's really into the weeds on this stuff, and she's been studying it for the last sort of five to ten years. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, it's it's really extraordinary because I think we we're just beginning to understand what the autistic brain is and what it brings to society. I mean, we know that autism is like an incredibly wide spectrum, right? Um, but when you actually look for differences in or the autistic brain to non-autistic brain, neurotypical brains, um, and you find a bunch of very sort of uh, counterintuitive things. Like some, some autistic people have bigger brains um, and some, some have like slightly bigger brain cells in certain areas, which they think, uh, you know, accounts for the extra sensory perception and increased enhanced memory and intelligence and vision and things like smell and taste. Um, so it really is a case of it being wired in a different way with there being um, larger regions. And, you know, the question is, you know, how has that evolved? Why has that evolved? Um, and as I say in the book, you know, what role has it played in shaping early human societies? Um, you know, when, when you think about the conditions of early humans out in the savannah. There are so many things that would have depended on, on like an autistic's ability to systematize and to um, you know come up with calendric systems. Um, and so I think, I think it would be really interesting to sort of as we do more and more research into autism and see you know, how fascinating it is. Um, uh, and how neurodiverse it is, right? Because there, there are likely to be so many different types of autism as well. I think the really interesting thing would be to, to investigate it also from this evolutionary anthropological um, slant to actually see, well, you know, this is a, these neurodiverse minds are extraordinary um, and, you know, how they contributed to uh, human history, because that's something that is missing from 
our human history narrative. Um, you know, we haven't, you know, I mean, in so many ways, we haven't looked at how neurodiverse people have massively contributed to so many aspects of human history. Um, so I think this is an area that, yeah, deserves a lot more research. Completely. And, and to take Sabine's question further and, and your answer, you, you go on the attack against the autism spectrum quotient test. Um, and, and you say at one point, the test goal is to create arbitrary lines to label lock people into arbitrary groups. Um, could you just flesh that out a little bit as well? Because I found that such an interesting moment. Yeah, I mean, so there are things like AQ, the, the autistic quotients and other measures, um, which I'm I'm quite critical of because, I mean, first of all, just from a purely scientific standpoint, when you actually dig into the science and the papers that back it up, it's really quite thin. Um, you know, they uh, incredibly small sample sizes, um, very strange criteria. Um, and you can see straight away, and, you know, Temple Grandin and other uh, autism advocates have, have pointed this out. You can see that it's essentially to, and I'm, I'm using one of Temple Grandin's words here, you can see this essentially to ghettoize uh, uh, people from the autistic community. Um, and I just think that's a fundamentally flawed approach to understanding something really interesting. Um, I mean, of course, we know that there are, there are people with autism that, that struggle in many ways with communication and socializing because it's such a wide spectrum. And I would never deny uh, those autistic people um, you know, their own right to, you know, seek some kind of uh, medical help to, to help them with certain aspects of things that they struggle with in a day-to-day -day basis. But again, it's such a wide spectrum and there are so many autistic people. I mean, I, I, I met some for this book who, who just say, you know, like, I don't struggle. I've just got a different mind and I don't, I don't want to be categorized in this way. And I don't, and, and, and this constant, uh, you know, uh, this constant sort of probing and 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 categorization and it, it just I don't know I just don't, I just don't think it helps I think it I think it further stigmatizes something that should have been unstigmatized decades ago um, and I just yeah I I think it's a very backwards way of studying something that's really interesting and. And what you said earlier about the atomization of society, I think that further atomizes, right? We sort of, we all go off into our little... Yeah, exactly, right, exactly. Instead of thinking about, instead of embracing the differences and seeing how they contributed to our long, uh, you know, uh, ama amazing natural history of, of human history and human brain evolution, I think that's more of an interesting approach. Completely. Um, now, another place in which we are atomized and, and ranked is school um, and Rachel says uh, I'm interested in your section about memory I'm a teacher who teaches a lot of dyslexic students they seem to struggle with short-term memory is this true uh, and how can this be changed or is this just a way that, that brains are wired so there's a couple of things there firstly um, is there any link between dyslexia and memory and then and then secondly perhaps something on neuroplasticity and kind of changing the wiring of our brain yeah that's a good question um I don't know if there's any solid evidence linking dyslexia and short-term memory loss. Um, I'd have to check on that. I, dyslexia is not, not really my area. Um, but again, um, the, from what I do know about dyslexia and also just my feeling is that, again, this is something that's going to be on a spectrum that we don't understand. Um, and uh, again, I think, it, you know, as, as, as long as we can, create systems that help those people um, in which in whatever they way they need help so like you know if there are dyslexics with with uh, problems with short-term memory um, it might be linked to this to dyslexia I suppose it depends on the individual case but it also might not be but then you have to think well you know what are what other strengths might that person have you know I'm not dyslexic um, but my short-term memory is pretty bad um, I think it's all about you know what's important to each individual mind because a lot of the time lapses in memory as well are not actually signs of like um, a pathology or, or something un unwanted. It's actually just because you're a bit tired and, or, and you're just not interested in it. So, um, and I know with education, it's incredibly hard because of the system, the system of education that we have. It's, in, it's incredibly hard to, to tailor education to every individual. Um, um, and it's only becoming harder with you know, very, very big uh, classroom sizes and we still have this system of rote learning, which is which is obviously necessary in many ways, but at the same time problematic in many ways. Um, but I would just say, yeah, I think 
I think if there are dyslexics with problems with short-term memory, the thing would be just to sort of try and investigate, you know, what are the strengths they have and and what other interests they have. Um, but I don't know the exact, the, you know, there might be uh, research studying the interaction of those things, but I'm not uh, familiar with it myself at the moment. So, you know, you, you, you advocate there for a lovely empathetic school system, which is of course incredibly difficult in, in current circumstances. I got into an argument yesterday, yesterday evening with someone who argued that AI is gonna fix teaching because loads of, uh, everyone can have a personal AI tutor. Um, you mentioned AI briefly earlier on um, and uh, your take in the book is that, um, you know, the breathtaking ingenuity of human intelligence will, will always be AI. Lots has happened to be fair since you finished uh, the book about AI could you just uh, dig into a little bit of AI do you think it's going to save us all uh, you know what's your take yeah I mean well I suppose the first thing I'd say is that I, I, I do think it's quite dangerous um, for all the reasons that people currently think it's dangerous I, I think I, I agree with them um, but in terms of yeah in terms of like the the, the kind of um, the allure of it and people saying, you know, oh, it's so much better than, than human intelligence. I don't really buy into that because it's just a different thing. Like AI is, is, is essentially an incredibly advanced data processing system. It takes everything you feed it and then it creates connections, no doubt, much faster than, than the way we do. And, and then it churns out an answer for you. Uh, in many ways, you know, I mean, I've been using sort of chat GBT recently, and in many ways, you know, it, it's a glorified autofill, you know, and it's incredibly impressive, don't get me wrong, but that's not, it doesn't create things in the way that human minds do, you know, human, because human minds have, have evolved over 7 million years to have a purpose, to have a niche, you know, we, we, reproduce, we, we reproduce, you know, as I say in the book, like, what's the niche and the purpose of an AI system? Is it, you know, is it just a great big data bank in some building tucked away, you know, underground or something like what's, you know, there's no, there's no biological imperative or niche in the way that there is for humans. And I think that gives us an edge in terms of our ability to adapt and to learn. Um, now, again, the, obviously AI, it's still in its infancy, although it's been worked on for decades, but um, yeah, it could be that, the data processing capabilities of AI get to such a point um, where it does essentially enfeeble humanity by by doing loads of jobs for us. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think we have to have a very careful discussion about what those jobs are, obviously. And we also have to have a careful discussion about exactly what this thing is, because I think it's a fallacy to say that AI is, you know, is so much more intelligent than human brains. Uh, you know, human brains are extraordinary you know we have 100 billion neurons um you know trillions of synaptic connections um and again we have neuroplasticity we have the ability to reorganize and reshape and i suppose an ai advocate would say that future ais will be able to do that and again but but again it's 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 data processing it, it will churn out for you what you chuck at it and i also worry about it in terms of like just from a moral philosophy point of view you know, if we create a society that becomes incredibly socially conservative, what's it going to churn out then? <laughs> it's quite, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't adapt and learn in the way that a human brain does. And um, so I think we need to be careful about, um, well, careful about what we use it for and also careful about the hype. So.